the name of Jesus. We thank you for the time today. We thank you, Lord, because we know you are a great God. We thank you because you are loving God. And I pray, oh Lord, today, everything that is blocking our progress, everything that is blocking our happiness and joy, everything that is blocking our prosperity, everything that is making us not to be independent, financially independent. Oh Lord, I pray, take everything away in Jesus' name. And all the fellowships and all the congregations that are joining us from all the countries in Africa and beyond Africa. Lord, I pray today you open a new door for everyone. A new door of new opportunity for everyone. And I pray that in your presence today there will be fullness of joy. All these beautiful, wonderful faces I see today, pour your blessings upon them. And these young people, they grow in at this wonderful time. Lord, I pray you will shield them from all the negative things of life in Jesus' name. And Lord, together, father, mother, and children, we will make it. We'll be happy here in life. Happy after we leave this world. We'll be prospered here in life. And then we're going to enter into great reward when we get to heaven. Bless your people abundantly today. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We're looking at the word of God concerning the family in Psalm 128. Psalm 128, I'm reading from verse 1. Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shall thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thy house. Thy children like only plants round about thy table. Behold that thus shall the man be blessed shall a man be blessed that fearest the lord the lord shall bless thee out of zion thou shalt see the good of jerusalem all the days of thy life yea yes thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon israel the chapter of the psalms describes a family that is free, free from anxiety, free from worry, free from problems, free from oppression, free from captivity, free from calamity, free from disease, free from death, free from familiar spirit, free from famine, free of the giants of the land. Free of hostility and hatred. Free of iniquity and infirmity. Free of everything you can think about. A family that is free. Free and free indeed. When God raises up a family. When God raises up an individual and he decides. He's going to pour the blessing of freedom on that family. What a great privilege. What a great opportunity. And that God has a smile on you. The countenance of his blessing upon your life. That God has his favor, his promise upon your life. And upon your family. And you read the psalm like this. And it begins with blessedness. And it says there is no exception here. It says blessed is everyone that fears the Lord. And you determine, you decide if you are going to be a candidate of that blessedness. That everyone... That fears the Lord. Everyone that reverences the Lord. Everyone that respects the Lord. Everyone that honors the Lord. Everyone that believes the Lord. Everyone that 
comes under the control, the direction of the Lord. Everyone who bless, who, who fears the Lord, he says, is walking in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of your hand. Robbers will not steal your property. The thieves, those who are not working, but want to feed on the labor of the industrials, of the hard worker, they will not touch your property. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. You know, it's not enough to have food, you must have appetite. It's not, to, it's not enough to have the properties and the things of this world. The Lord must give you the physical stress and the health to enjoy what you have labored to put together. Happy shall thou be. It shall be well with you. You go out, it will be well with you. You come in, it will be well with you. And every step of the way, as you plan your life, as you live your life, just walking in the commandments of the Lord, just living according to the word of the Lord, it says, it shall be well with you. There may be a thousand demons in the neighborhood, they will not come near you. Then it says, thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine. By the size of thine house. Can we banish barrenness in our church? Can we cancel barrenness in our church? Can we agree together? A two official agree. As touching anything. That to ask of my father. Jesus said. I will give each unto you. And if we can agree together in faith. I will say this church will be a church where when the barren people come in, they'll have children. Because it says, if you fear the Lord, thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Then it says, your children will be like holy plants on the bottom thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Amen. And thou shalt see good. You will see good. Amen. Evil will clear out of your way. Amen. Oppression will vanish out of your sight. Amen. The Lord will take his spiritual broom and sweep out everything. That's coming from the satanic that power, walk, world of darkness. Sweep everything away from your family in Jesus' name. It says, yes. It says, thou shalt see thy children's children. What does that mean? Maybe you don't understand. Thou shalt see thy children's children. It's saying that you will live old enough. Long up to see your children get married and to see your children that get married having children and you will see and you will carry your children's children hey you have many years to live I said you have many years to live because if you have not seen your own child yet, you know that's nothing to be sad about. You say, you know, God is giving me more time to live. I'm 40, I'm not seeing my child, and I'm still going to see my children's children. You're still going to belong in this place where we are. And the blessings of God is going to abound in your life. And then if you don't have, you know, you don't have a child yet, and yet you are going to see your children's children. How about that? This uh, coming year, your own child will come. And then those children, they will not die young. They will get married while you are still alive. And thou shalt see thy children's children, and you will see peace upon Israel. We're looking at Psalm 144. Psalm 144, I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 144, I'm reading from verse 11. Read me 
and deliver me from the hand of strange children. Whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is the right hand of falsehood, that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, and that our daughters may be as cornerstones, polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, fold in all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in, no going out, that there be no complaining in our streets. Happy is that people, that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Now you will see, in all these passages we are reading, that when you know the Lord, when you believe the Lord, when you love the Lord, when you obey the words of the Lord, there are great blessings upon you as a person, upon your wife, upon your husband, upon your children, upon the work of your hand. In short, you are free in the whole family. That's why today we are going to elaborate more, explain more, expound more what it means to have freedom for the whole family. But you know, if you went to a doctor, and the doctor just, uh, you know, met you, and he began, he has not even examined you. He, he began to give you prescription, and then he give you medicine. And you're not going to appreciate that medicine, and you're not going to use the medicine. You're going to say, what kind of doctor is this? I'm not sure I need this. I'm not sure that uh, this is necessary for me, because the doctor did not prepare you. To know the value of the medicine that is giving you. And to know the necessity of the, of the medicine is giving you. But then you get to the doctor and you sit down. You open your mouth. First of all, it takes the temperature of your mouth. Because the temperature of your mouth can tell a lot about your body. About everything happening in your life. Your tongue tells a lot of stories about you. And then it begins to you know, ask you questions. I about this, I about this, I about this. Then he even goes back to you. And you have some hereditary thing. How about your daddy? How about your mommy? Is there a history of hypertension, high blood pressure? Is there a history of diabetes? Is there a history of epilepsy? Is there a history of this and that? He begins to probe. And then he, you know, he, he, and he writes some, little, some things down. And after that, he begins to ask you, you know, what you eat. Because sometimes, what you eat is what is eating you up. And then, as he looks at that, then begins to look at your time. How do you spend your time? How do you sleep? Do you have enough sleep? And do you have enough rest? And then after that, hey, do you ever exercise? Do you ever go out? Or you just a bookworm and just sitting on the table every time you wake up in the morning, you start eating and, and sitting, eating and sitting. And then you're now obese. And, and obesity is causing a lot of problems. And, and the doctor begins to probe you. Hi, hey, about this, hi, hey, about this, hi, hey, about that. And then after that, now a doctor says, hey, Give me a minute. And then he goes into his office and he puts, uh, you know, he brings some instruments and he, you know, puts something on the head and, you know, it attaches it to you. And he begins to see the, the beating, the rhythm of your heart. And as he looks at that, and then he says, hmm. He say, Doctor, what do you see? He says, well, I'm coming. And then he, he, he gets, he says, I come and stand in here and, uh, you know, remove your outer dress. And he puts you before this x ray. He wants to look at everything inside. And he begins to look at everything. And then he's jotting some notes down. 
I tell you, actually, he put something inside your throat. He wants to see what is inside. He's probing. He's probing. He wants to discover, discover your state, your present state, before he recommends anything. If you just went to the doctor, and then the doctor began to recommend, and the doctor began to say, take this uh, two times a day, and take this, uh, you know, after taking your breakfast, and take this, you're not going to appreciate it. And at all the testing, at all the examination, at all the probing, at all the x-ray, then he sits now, he says, you know, I I'm wondering how you could still be alive. I'm wondering how you even walk from your house and you go to this hospital. It's, it's like you should have died some months ago with what I see. With what I found out. With the examination I conducted, I'm wondering, it's good you came today. Because if you are delayed for one more week, I will not have seen you in my, you know, speech you here. I've been attending your, I will be attending your funeral. Then you are saying, Doctor, can we do anything about it? You are eager now. And whatever medicine he gives you, you pay attention. And he says, take this. Don't take it. Less than any, the gram I'm giving you. Take this in the morning. You finish eating, take this. And then, in the afternoon, take this. In the evening, take this. You will study everything that the doctor is telling you. As if you are preparing for exam. You say, Dr. Josh, I just in case I forget, I'm, I'm, uh, can you help me? I want to write you down. You put everything down. Take this, take this, take this. And then you put all those pills in different subjects. This one is for morning and end there. This one is for afternoon there. This one is for the evening. You're very, very meticulous. You know why? Because he told you, he told you, you would have died if you didn't come today. You must probe. You must find out what are the problems before you can provide the solution. If I just came here and I begin to tell you, and I say freedom, this is how to be free. You will not appreciate it unless I told you, number one, the problem. Number one, the burden of bondage in the family. The burden of bondage in the family. What happens in the family? What is the burden of bondage in the family? Number two now, the beginning of breakthrough in the family. You see, when you discover what the problem is, you discover what the burden of bondage is, then and only then, you'll say, tell me how I can get out of this. And you're going to get out. I said you're going to get out. The beginning of breakthrough in the family. Number three. The blessedness of beatitudes in the family. The blessedness of beatitudes in the family. Let's come to number one. As we look at number one, what are the things families are wrestling with? What are the things families are battling with? What are the problems families are just saying? If I can get out of these deep waters, then I will know that I have freedom, I have fullness, I have fruitfulness in my family. The burden of bondage in the family. Now let's look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 16. And not not... This woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, lo, these thirty years be loosed from this bound, this bond on the Sabbath day. Here is a woman that was in bondage, and the spirit of infirmity bound her eighteen years. That's a problem in the family. When a member of the family has the spirit of infirmity 
for 80 years. You know the implication? The implication is instead that woman of that woman being the center of activity, she is the center of attention. The husband cannot stay far away. The children cannot stay far away. Not only that. Instead of providing for the needs of members of the family, the money, the finance goes to taking care of that woman, of the wife, because there is sickness and there is a spirit of infirmity and it is bondage. This woman bound 18 years. And 18 years, it was more than 18 years if she didn't meet the Lord Jesus Christ. If she didn't meet the Lord, the 18 years would have extended to more than 18 years, to 20 to 25. She might die in that situation. The body of bondage in the family. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 23. Acts of Apostles, chapter 8, verse 23. For I perceive that thou art in the God of bitterness. And in the bond of iniquity. And you know, there are times that people get married. And then the, before the marriage, the mother of the man said, I'm against the marriage. I don't want you to marry this lady. I said, That's the lady I want. I want to marry her. I'm a Christian. I believe in the Lord. I'm going to do the will of God. Mama said, But no, I'm your mother. I don't want you to marry her. And then she influenced your father, and your father said, Boy, though you are 27, you are still our boy. Listen, pay attention. We want you to marry the lady. Ah, Papa, we have always agreed, but if we are going to disagree, on this one point, we are going to disagree. I will marry her. And then, Papa is bitter, Mama is bitter, and then you get married. And uh, Papa is not just like his beater. Papa is not a Christian. Mama is not a Christian. And they want to prove to you that they did agree with that sin. And the bitterness takes them to, you know, powers of darkness. And they begin to fight against the family. And then you realize everywhere you go, there is a roadblock. Everywhere you go, you're, you're knocking your head against a, an iron wall. There is a bond of iniquity, and there is a goal of bitterness. And then we're told in um, Hebrews chapter 12, the burden of bondage in the family. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 15, looking diligently. Let's say any fail of the grace of